to this edition of the Angels and Destiny show. Why is this show called this? And you may ask. So I'll tell you, the accepted meaning of angel is messenger and the accepted meaning of destiny is to make firm establish. So I'm guessing I bring you messages to establish what you need to know in the present. And also, I like working with angels and the calmness they bring. Now, in a moment, I will introduce you to my wonderful guest, Dr. Deborah Moore. But before that, I'd like to say thank you so much for watching the show live at a later date, as it really means a lot to us to be able to connect with like-minded people. Now, first off, if you've never met me before, then my name is Ray, and I'm a guide who helps you remember your divine presence so that you can heal your past, create your future, and transform your present, to expand your consciousness, understand your spiritual path, and take charge of your destiny so you can spread your wings and soar. Now, I'm the founder of Radiant Angel Energy, and through divine presence, virtual and actual retreats, transformational packages, a six-week guided meditation series for confidence, workshops and so much more. I help you remember why you are here, your spiritual path and the clarity of the next steps to take. Now each episode of this show covers various themes of your journey, a mini guided meditation and an oracle angel card reading with the wisdom of my wonderful guests like today's guest Dr Deborah Moores about the wisdom of the stars. Now our, um, Deborah is passionate about helping individuals tap into their unique potential and wonder. With her bubbly and hopeful personality, Deborah brings a sense of calm and positivity to her audiences, making her a strategic asset in their journey of self-discovery. Her intuition and eloquence make her an attractive listener who helps people connect to their core being and appreciate the beauty of the world around them. With her unique approach, she brings a touch of magic and wonder to her students' lives. Deborah is dedicated to helping people achieve their goals and become the best version of themselves. Now, you can be expect to be uplifted, motivated and inspired on your journey to discover your unique value as an individual. Deborah has won awards for her speaking, having been trained by the world's top professional speaking coach. She also brings inspiring images from her travels and her art. Known as being a very entertaining speaker and able to translate complex scientific and artistic principles into everyday language. Deborah is frequently recommended and sought after. And working with astrology, Deborah gives you new insights into who you truly are. Um, and she, and she, you know, she gave me some insights into my chart that I hadn't even realised existed. So, without further delay, hello, Deborah, and welcome to Angels and Destiny Show. How are you today? Thank you, thank you, Ray. I'm really well. Thank you very much. Brilliant. So before we get into this fascinating conversation, I want to remind you that not only can you share this video, but you can also ask questions, leave comments and thoughts as both Deborah and I want to be part of this conversation and we will reply. So please don't be shy. So Deborah, why don't you tell us more about your journey and about the wisdom of the stars? Yeah, for sure. I'd love to. Thank you, Ray. Yeah, so um, I was born actually in the late 50s. And um, my mother, we, my parents separated when I was about eight and uh, I was the oldest of three girls and my mother wasn't sure whether we were very clever or not. And then when I passed my 11 plus, she was like, oh, hang on a minute, I might have a clever one here. <laughs> and, um, you know, went to grammar school and I was really pushed into science, whereas my heart was in art. <laughs> um, and uh, I really wanted to leave at 16. I wanted to go traveling. No, stay, stay. I wanted to leave at 18, go traveling. No, no, apply for uni. Didn't think I'd get in, but I did. So off I went and three years of biochemistry. And I was like, oh my God, I hate this. I hate it. I loathe it. I don't want to do this. But again, it was like, no, no, you stick at it. And I got, I was offered this job in Leicester. I didn't need a good degree. He didn't care. He just wanted me to come. And the only saving grace for that job was that although I was in a biochemistry department and I was doing like research and experiments, which I mean, I was really useless at it, but it was an electron microscopy project. And I'd been really interested in electron microscopy since I was at school and I first you know, heard about electron microscopes. So the thing about an electron microscope is that it doesn't use light, it uses electron beams, which means that you can magnify to, you know, like 100,000 times or whatever. 
and you can really see tiny, tiny details, you know, even in the smallest cells and bacteria. And I love that, you know, I love seeing the detail in the cells and everything. And it was so beautiful. They were just so beautiful. And, you know, that was what hooked me. That was the only bit of science that really hooked me was the detail that you could see inside cells. So, um, so I did this electron microscopy project and <laughs> one day I got this result and I was like, that's not normal. And I called my boss in and I said, what's happened? He looked at me and he said, what have you done? What did you do? You did something different. And of course I'd made a mistake and I washed with water instead of a saline solution. But it had made the thing that I was looking at, which was like these long filaments, these filaments that you find in your muscles, it had made them spring apart. You know, they'd all repelled from each other. And he'd been trying to prove it physically for years. <laughs> and, um, and he was like, you've done it. You've done it. You've proved it. But you see, it was a mistake. You know, I, I, I wasn't a good scientist. <laughs> Well, you might have thought it was the same, but the universe thought it was brilliant. Absolutely. And, you know, I got a paper in Nature, which, you know, if you know, it's the leading science magazine. I had a paper in Journal of Molecular Biology. But by this time, I'd been there, for, I'd been doing this for nearly two years, and it was a three-year project. And I, I, I just hated being there. And... Um, so I used to rock up for work about 10, go for coffee at half past 10, go to, you know, stay for an hour or so of coffee, go to lunch at 12, come back about two, do another bit of work, go to coffee again for an hour, do another half an hour, and then I go home. And, um, and I, so I went to my boss and I said, look, I'm never here. You're paying me and I'm never here. He said, I don't care. You do the work when you're here. And, you know, this, is, this has been a really, this was really the start of, my sort of part of my journey really into understanding that my brain doesn't function, you know, like a, a, you know, a typical scientist. I just can't stay for hours and hours and hours focused on something. Anyway, so he persuaded me, he said, look, just finish your three years, get your PhD, and then you can do what you want. I'm like, all right, then, if you don't mind, only come in two or three hours a day. And um, so, yeah, I finished the three years, but then, of course, I had to write up. So I was like, well, what, how am I going to do that? So I thought I need the money. So I did a teach training year. And so I got a grant. In those days, we had grants and they were very nice. Thank you very much. They were plenty to live on. <laughs> Even got holiday with if you were careful. <laughs> um, and I loved, you know, I, I, I loved being a student. You know, it was the one thing that made working in the lab it was in a university it made it you know like enjoyable because i could go out and be a student still and party and um so i did my teacher's training year and it was really interesting in the sense that i'd never done anything like sociology or psychology or anything like that before and i'd never been asked to to explore something that i had a free I was free to go with it where I wanted to go. There were no facts. Because in science, it's all facts. It's right mm. or wrong. And this was really liberating for me. I'd never had that experience before. But my tutor recognized within a few weeks, he said, you're never going to be a teacher, are you? You're just not going to fit into a school, are you? And I was like, no, probably not. I'm just doing this to write up my PhD and get the grant money. <laughs> So he was wonderful and he sent me off to teach in a place called Counterthought College because I lived in Leicester at the time, which was um, it was a state school, but they ran it really differently where it was like big teams of, of, of people, young people with a team of teachers and the young people all did project work and they could do whatever they wanted whenever they wanted. Wow. And they had like a choice of two or three science lessons and I was teaching science. So you know, they all had to come to me at least once a week, um, but they could choose when they wanted to come. And that was, you know, that was quite fun. But, uh, you know, I knew I wasn't going to teach. So, of course, they was like, well, what am I going to do now? And my boss said to me, do you know what? I think that, and I, I, oh, honestly, my PhD, 
the woman who was doing my viva, it's called a viva, oral, she said to me, you haven't the faintest idea what you're talking about, but in nicer words. Yeah. She said, you made a mistake in your solution that you've used for the whole three years right at the beginning. Did you notice that? And she pointed it out and I went, oh, yeah. <laughs> ah. Oh, well. <laughs> and um, But she said, but you put in a lot of work. Oh, I had two albums. I was the first person to um, write my PhD up on a word processor at the university. Um, oh, that was a nightmare in itself. <laughs> we were living on pot noodles in the middle of the night, trying to write this thing up in this computer, just telling me all the time I made a mistake. <laughs> um, anyway, but there was also a separate album like this of photographs I'd done of the electron microscopy photo, and they were beautiful. It was a beautiful album. And they were all, it, you know, it wasn't like nowadays where you can actually get it printed into the paper. These were separate photos stuck down and I chose like a pale green paint card and, oh, you know, they were beautiful. And she said, yeah. well, I'm going to give it to you because it looks good. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Anyway, but I said to my boss, what am I going to do? I don't know what to do. And I said, I think you should apply for a job in Boston in America. And though this was the most prestigious lab that I could apply for in the field that I was in. So I applied. She even paid for me to go for an interview. I know. I turn up in this lab in Boston. It's full. You know, I'm used to it. You know, PhD students all working late in the night and the weekends. This lab was full of people in white coats. And um, she had my CV in her hand, little paper in those days. And uh, she said to me, hmm, I see you like to do voluntary work. Were you thinking of doing that here? Because in Leicester, I used to run a youth club for people with learning difficulties a couple of evenings a week. I loved it. And I went, uh, yeah. Uh, and I looked at the wall at the clock. It was seven o'clock in the evening. Remember, I left work at four. <laughs> I was like, oh, my God. Oh, oh, no. Oh, no. This is the American work ethic where you're literally at work all the time. I thought, I thought I'm never gonna see any of America. I, I, you know, uh, uh, and I was like, I don't think I can, I, don't, I, was, I, was, I was like, I don't know what to do. I, I don't know I can do this. And I went back to the UK and um, I went to visit my father's sister. Now she loves me. She didn't have any kids of her own. And I would always make sure I went to visit her in London and her and her husband were failed actors. He used to get a little bit of work occasionally. Otherwise, he made his money from framing old pictures and selling them on Portobello Road. My whole father's family were involved in selling antiques on Portobello Road. Anyway, so she was a poet and she was into Virginia Woolf and, you know, and all that sort of thing. And she was the first person I ever knew to wear thrift shop clothes. And, and uh, anyway, so I went to visit her and she said to me, Oh, you must be so excited about going to America to this job, you know, how exciting. And I went, yeah, quite excited about going to America, but I'm not excited about the job. And she went, oh, darling, oh, darling, what would you like to do? You know what? Nobody had ever asked me what I would like to do. Oh, wow. I'd been at uni for seven years. Nobody ever asked me, what is it you would like to do? And, um, and I said, well, if I hadn't have been clever, I would have gone traveling at all those points when I had to make a decision. That's what I would have done. And she said to me, well, why don't you go traveling now? And I just sort of looked at her. I thought, wow, you're giving me permission to go and do what I'd really like to do. And that was it. I, I um, went back to Leicester, packed everything up, gave everything away and bought a one way ticket halfway around the world. Um, stopping off in America for a few months and then in New Zealand for a bit and then ending up in Australia and said to everybody, I'll be gone for a year. And my boss said, somebody else will have you back when you get back. I was gone for four years. And of course, I got into um, environmentalism. I don't know if you remember, but I was part of a big um, campaign in Tasmania to save the last wild river from being dammed. 
I lived in the bush for three months. Um, I learned lots of, I started learning about complementary therapies, which I, I, you know, I used to take vitamin supplements. That was about my limit. You know, I didn't know any more than that. And, um, and, and I, I got back into art. Um, I was doing, cause I was, that's what I wanted to do at school. I wanted to do textile design. And I, so I was, I learned to do batik and I was making clothes and, you know, just, you know, just like all these years catching up with me. And I came back to the UK and um, I was having a really, really, really hard. I, I thought I'd gone mad. I, 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 I'd gone traveling with these two women and one of them was a real bully. She was very nasty to me. And I literally thought I'd lost my mind. And then I met her sister who was an astrologer. And she said to me, oh, you're having your Saturn return. You'll get out, you'll come out of it. And one day I woke up and mine was a particularly long Saturn return. You know, they happen around age 29 when Saturn comes back to the place when you were born. Some people, they're only like six months and pretty easy. Mine was two years and really not very nice at all. Um, and she said, you'll come out of it. And I woke up one day and I thought, oh, I'm back to me again. It was really weird. It was like I'd been struck dumb for two years. And I was like, wow, I feel normal again. And then my, my aim was to have a baby. Okay, this might be a bit shocking, but I just wanted to have a baby. I didn't care about the relationship. I tried loads of relationships. I just wanted to have a baby. And I met this guy. And again, you know, I did, I did a whole ritual around it. I knew this guy's primary color was gray, beige. And I met one guy who was gray and beige. No, he wasn't the right one. He turned out to be homosexual. And then he, this guy turned up. And I thought, wow, you're very gray and beige. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he said to me, I'm lonely. And I said, I want a baby. And he said, okay, I'll help you. <laughs> but it turned out he was an astrologer. And he said, let me look at your chart for you. And he looked at my chart and he said, um, hmm. He said, Venus, Mercury, 11 and a half degrees of Pisces. You'd make a good astrologer. I went, really? He said, yeah. So he taught me how to draw a chart. He said, look, there's all my books. Borrow what you like. And I started just doing charts for people. And I have not stopped since. So that was ugh, nearly 40 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and after like a couple of years, um, I went and did a diploma. And I had no idea. I just knew I wanted, I was into like, you know, getting qualifications at the time. <laughs> and, um, and I had no idea, you know, what astrology schools were available. I just happened to have a copy of Resurgence magazine. There was an advert in there and it was really colorful for an astrology school. And I thought, oh, that looks good. Okay, I'll, take, I'll do that one. <laughs> and it's weird, you know, because um, what made that school special was their emphasis on color. No other school uses it in the way that they do. And it for me now, it, it's a core part of my astrology because, you know, it the colors represent the elements and the basis of astrology, of course, is the four elements. Yeah. And then, um, so you, you, this diploma course, you had to take a minimum of two years because the idea was that you went through this journey of looking at you, finding yourself and everything took me seven and I was pretty quick actually <laughs> <laughs> and um and yeah so since then uh, at the time I had already developed my own flower essences I was using those and I was also a kinesiologist I'd already trained as a kinesiologist so I was already using muscle testing as a way of helping people by testing which flower essence they needed and then I'd know roughly what was going on in their process what their next step needed to be and as, as the astrology started to grow and I started to become more confident and I was starting to get clients, so the flower essences sort of disappeared because the astrology was, I mean, it, it, literally it's a map. You know, if you know somebody's birth time, I mean, you know, even without the birth time, you've still got a map. But if you've got the birth time, you know, there's a map of what the heavens look like in the moment that person was born and no two people have the same map 
you'd literally have to have another baby being born right next to you, literally on top of you, and taking that first breath at the same time to have the same astrology map. Um, and and so suddenly I had this map and because I'd been taught to work so intuitively, I hadn't been taught to work by rote. The astrology school I worked with, it was all about what is your experience of this. If I if I ever copied anything out of a book, I was I, I got marked down massively. Oh, wow. If I wrote totally from my own experience, I'd get all A's. Um so it really trained me to work very intuitively, which is very, very different how to the majority of other astrologers were trained. They all were trained. Venus and Scorpio means duh, 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 duh. You know what I mean? And I wasn't trained like that. I was trained, okay, so you feel like what Venus is about. You feel like what Scorpio is about. Put the two together. What do you come up with? And it's all about a feeling at that point it's only when i meet the person whose chart it is and i say i can ask some questions and then i go oh okay yeah your venus and scorpio manifests like this yes i can see how that relates to my feeling <laughs> <laughs> um because the thing about astrology is it works at a whole spectrum of levels so it works for at the very, very unconscious level where we're literally just batted about to the very conscious level. And when we understand that our map, our star map can work at this whole range of levels and that different bits of the map will be working at a range of levels, then we can go, OK, so this bit keeps tripping me up. This bit I'm using probably at its full potential. And, and then there's often bits that we just completely ignore. You would not believe how many people have particularly things in Taurus and Leo, which and Taurus is all about the voice and Leo is about performing you would not believe how many people I will say to them, did you love to perform or did you love to sing or did you love to do drama as a kid? Oh, I loved it. Oh, I loved it. What do you do now? Oh, nothing. And I'm like, why? You know, like so much of it I find is things that we've left behind in childhood. It's mm. like that first seven to 10 years we are in our magical phase. You know, they say that up until the age of seven, we don't actually know the difference between our imaginal world and the real world. And so we tend to live in a very imaginal phase. And, you know, it's similar to Einstein, you know, where he got all his information from. He said, I never got it from my thinking mind. I got it all from up there. And, um, and so, but then we lose it, we get to seven, which I've forgotten, the Steiner people, Rudolf Steiner had a word for it. I, I, yeah, I, I can't remember what it is, yeah. But at seven, we have our first quarter of the Saturn cycle. And Saturn is about keeping us safe and about grounding us into the material world. And so around the age seven, it's when we really start to make our own definitions of what's right, what's wrong, how to um, obey the rules, what the rules are, you know, how we function in a material world. And it's a bit like this poor child has been living in this imaginary fantasy world, just going plonk like this. And, you know, that's why I think a lot of, um, you know, seven to 10 year olds are really struggling, actually. Yeah. Um, particularly because we have so, you know, this thing about neurodiversity, even though I believe we're all diverse, you know, none of us have the same brain, but some people do tend to sit more on, somebody described it to me as like a, um, a, a burst of lines coming out. It's not a, a line like this. It's all these lines coming out from a center and that we all sit somewhere on one of these lines coming out and whether we sit closer to the center so that we can deal with this material world a bit more easily 
or we sit further out and we're like, I can't deal with this. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, and of course, over the last three years, I think because we, we were all able to hide in our little holes and be as weird as we wanted to be and be as neurodiverse as we wanted to be, we've all come back in the re real world and gone, oh, God, I'm a long <laughs> way from this <laughs> now. <laughs> anyway, but, you know, so I really, you know, and I think particularly at the moment, we've got a lot of children coming through. Well, it's been, been coming through for the last 20 odd years. You know, you see young people in their early 20s who are really struggling mm. you know whether you want to call them indigo children or crystal children or whatever you want to call them you know there certainly has been a shift and a shift in acceptance of neurodiversity and so when we go back to the chart um it's much easy you know it's like it starts to reveal it uranus is a classic so when people first meet me they meet uranus and I'm Aquarius rising. So I am so Uranian. And in the old days, I remember once I was on a protest march where nobody else knew me. And we were all lying down as blockading Princess Street in Edinburgh. And we all got put in a cell over the weekend. And this young woman, she came up to me and she said, are you an undercover cop? <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> but it's because Uranus can appear quite aloof right. and quite detached. And um, of course, I didn't know that at the time because I wasn't an astrologer. But now I realize people meet Uranus and they, you know, I live in a van, I do all sorts of weird things, you know, and blah, blah, blah. Um, so, you know, what I love, the thing I really, in fact, I've had this said to me a couple of times, particularly by people who have been through a lot of psychiatry type therapy. So I was talking to this young woman recently. She's American. Well, young, you know, young compared to me. She's in her 40s. And I did a reading with her. I did know her, but I didn't know about her. And she said, oh, my God, she said, I can't believe her. She said, you've uncovered more about me in two hours than 10 years of therapy. Wow. Because it's so fast. You know, I can see the potential and I can see where the problems might be. I don't know what they are, but I can see where they're going to be. And I can see when they were triggered because I can use the chart as a clock. Now, this is very particular to the school that I studied with. I'm going to say now, I studied with the Huber School and there is no branch in Britain anymore. It was originated in Switzerland and the Hubers have both died and I have no idea whether the school still exists or anymore or anything. Astrology has really gone out of popularity in terms of studying. People are interested, but they don't want to study it anymore. And that's another really interesting story because I've been, you know, playing around with teaching astrology for years and I literally just created a course, 20 week course. And it was a giveaway price. I thought I'm going to give it away, almost give it away so that I get this first group through and I've got all the recordings done and know what I'm doing. Nobody wanted to do it. I was like, I can't believe this. And then I started asking people, telling people about it. And they go, oh, I can't, I can't study anymore. You see, this is one of the things that I think has really changed in the last, I can't read anymore. Mm. I can't study anymore. You know, I just don't have that concentration anymore. Oh, I can't study anymore. I was like, oh, everybody's got it in their program, in their minds, that it's really hard mm. to learn astrology. And it did used to be. You know, it took forever to learn how to construct a chart because we didn't have computers. You know, yeah. now you just type it all in. It's up there in 30 seconds. And I thought, oh, that's what it is. They're all programmed to believe it's really hard. Well, it's not hard at all. If you do it experientially, as long as you know what the four key elements are, earth, fire, air and water, it's a doddle. So um I'm now going through this process of um, explaining to people and I've actually now advertised it as an astrology course for people with neurodiversity who learn intuitively and creatively and um, kinesthetically 
and you know who can't study so there is no studying involved it's it's like an average of an hour a week on a zoom call that's it um but so coming back to actually looking at the chart as time has gone on and particularly over the last three years with everybody really waking up I'm like I'm looking at the chart from ever higher levels so I'm looking at the chart I'm looking at particularly Uranus Neptune and Pluto because the highest expressions of those are all egoless they are all about service and they're all about moving into that multidimensional awareness and about, you know, transcending this very solid material existence. They're all about that. And so, you know, looking at people's charts and going, wow, and especially because I'm getting so many people coming through now in around 60, early 60s age, when they came, they were born in the 60s when we had the Pluto Uranus conjunction in Virgo and we had Vietnam, we had, you know, hippies, we had all, you know, psychedelics. It's like people's consciousness was going like that. In fact, um, I had a woman on yesterday and she said to me, I die. I was born, not die. She said, I was born on the day that JFK was shot. Oh, wow. So, you know, and, and it, she had it on the top of her chart, on the MC, the place where we come into our authority, where we stand as an authority. And she had it up there. Wow, that's, that, that, that's amazing. And it's really interesting, the fact that now we are moving into those higher dimensions and the planets are all showing that. Um, now, which is why I think another reason why people have got a lot of interest in um, astrology, um, may obviously said not not the studying it, but have got so much interest. What's going on in the planets? What's going on? Yes, um, here you know, especially as we're coming into the age of Aquarius now, fully. Absolutely. Um, so, little warning: Pluto does go back into Capricorn for the rest of this year. Yeah. Uh, it's just that people, you know, I was just talking to a friend. She said, oh, you know, you know, and I go far right. And I said, look, they're just having their last temper tantrum. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so exactly. We'll next year. Yeah. So don't exactly. worry about it. Certainly don't give it any energy. <laughs> No, def, def, definitely, definitely don't. You know, the old is crumbling. They, you know, it's just that little clasping at straws. Oh, my God, it's all going. What can I do now? It'll all be gone. Yeah. Yeah. But, 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 but I am noticing that people are, are, even people like myself, you know, who are very, very aware of what the wisdom of the stars is telling us. Got to get that name in. Um, mm. <laughs> definitely. Um. I still have to keep myself in check because we are so programmed to think ahead, you know, to have something that we're working towards and we've got to line out this path. Yeah. And I keep having to remind myself, we haven't the buggiest idea what's going on. Just be in the present. What's the next thing you need? Oh, you need a drink. Go and get a drink. Right. Be in the present. What's the next thing? Do you know what I mean? That's all we can do is look at what is the next little step. And that's basically what I do with people in the astrology. I say to them, what is it you're working towards? What is it your dream? And they'll say whatever their dream is. And I go, OK, so the next step is you've got blah, blah, blah happening in your chart, which means your next step is blah, blah, blah. And then we look at what the next step is and then the next step. And I go, and you've got this series of steps. And as long as you take those, then you will find yourself expressing that astro astrological aspect, which is perfect for what it is you want to do. You will express that at the highest possible level that you can. And it won't just beat you about <laughs> because you've not been listening. <laughs> I love that. I, I, I think I think that's absolutely brilliant. You know, and the fact that you know we can use 
um, astrology, we can use the stars, the planets, etc. You know, the the wisdom of the stars and the planets to actually work out our next steps of of where we're going because the steps already there. It's just whether we listen and follow those steps. Yeah, and it's about you know knowing the energy that is available in that step. You know, whether you're on a Saturn transit, you need to be planning. Right. Or whether you're on a Venus transit, you need to be receiving and doing what you love to do. Or on a Mars transit, just go for it. Just work. Just go. (laughs) You know what I mean? It's like each transit has such a different energy. And to tell you the truth, most of us, because we are already automatic DNA antenna, we already do live the stars. But there's always I mean, when one thing you probably noticed, because that's what most people say to me, I hadn't realized that actually everything was already a lie, that I that everything was exactly how it was meant to be. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so but it, it's having that conscious awareness rather than just being slightly manipulated by me. For me, it's about co-creating. That when we have a conscious awareness, then we can deliberately co-create rather than serendipitously co-create. Yeah, perfect. And that brings us quite nicely on to uh, the next segment, which, as um, everyone who's watching knows, each week I like to ask my guests whether they'd like me to do a mini guided meditation or put an angel oracle card for them. And Deborah believe it or not, actually does tarot cards as well. And she has kindly said that she will pull a card for everyone who's watching who's watching this or, um, live or at a later date. So go ahead. Okay, so we've got the Eight of Wands. Um, this is um, probably the only minor arcana that doesn't actually have a character in it in the Rider Waite suit, which... I do have another pack, but I don't have it with me. Um, these are always my standard, how do we cope with the material world level? <laughs> my other set is more cosmic. But this set, I feel like, is really useful for dealing with the material world and dealing with the fact that we are in a physical, emotional, mental body. You know, we are not light beings, you know, like, whatever we still have we are still in this body and we do have to function in the material world even though our hearts are like beings yeah so for me the ones is um creativity spirituality eight you're coming to this culmination with the eight the culmination in the nine and you're coming to this culmination it's almost like that final conscious thinking about something you know how you're going to actually because the nines is where you implant it in your unconscious and then you can't help it it will manifest in whatever form you have put it into your unconscious so the eights are very much i feel about really aligning those thoughts so that when it sits in the unconscious it is what you want it to be and the for me the eight of wands is about focus because you know, we all talk about intention and intention is a combination of focus and openness. I see it as a bit like um, a, a radar dish, you know, like one of those big telescopes. And you've got this huge dish picking up as much subtle information as it can. And then you've got this. I don't think the bit in the middle is the bit that focuses, but the information is all focused into that central antenna. And I've been looking quite recently a lot at the fact that our DNA is an antenna Mm. and that we are picking up on all these electromagnetic vibrations and also we are receiving electromagnetic vibrations. And so there's something there about that focus, you know, that we're being asked to move into multidimensional awareness, but equally we have to stay absolutely focused like today, Neptune's unaspected. Oh, my God. I'm listening to people making like, don't make a decision today. We've got unaspected <laughs> Neptune. You're in a fantasy world. 
um so um it for me it's all about i mean you know we all know this law of attraction it's like you i remember one not long ago somebody gave me five thousand pounds i really need i i i was struggling she gave me five thousand pounds and i was like oh that's amazing thank you so much put it in the bank i thought i got a minute i got a minute you have no idea what that felt like yeah. <laughs> and so i had to go back and really experience what receiving five thousand pounds it was like wow actually the openness that is required to receive that and it just poof, just upgraded my energy and it really made me realize that when we want when we're intending something when we're focusing on something we really want something to manifest that's what abraham hicks talks about when he said about moving into the energy of what it is that you want to experience so i think that's what that's about Beautiful. So Deborah's done a card for myself and everyone watching. So I'm now going to do a card for Deborah and everyone that's um, that's watching. Oh, exciting! So, I know. So what does Deborah and everyone who's watching this live for a later date need to know for their high good at this moment? Oh, okay. We'll go with that one, shall we? As soon as it jumped out. Perfect. Answering the call. The time is now. <laughs> So not only does it tie with Deborah's card, but it also ties in um, with what Deborah's doing and everything and yeah. what you who are watching this are actually doing. You know, now is the time, you know, the, the, the time for, for thinking, oh, I'll do it tomorrow. Um, oh, well, I'll, I'll get some more qualifications and then I'll do it. No. The time is now, you know, that door is open. The vista is out there. The world is out there for you. It wants you to come out and share your gifts, your talents. So answer the call. Do it now. Don't yeah. Wait. I, there's, there's a phrase in the online coaching business, which is um, progress, not perfection. <laughs> I like and, that. Yeah. And... Um, definitely you know it's like being in the present what's the next best thing for me to do now and do it <laughs> yeah de definitely 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 um uh, uh do it you know you you can't have any more clearer than around both my card and um deborah's card so deborah do you have any insights or thoughts to leave our viewers any last minute words of wisdom oh yes um actually it's a bit of a an offering um, is sharing. Every day I do an astrology tip for the day. And if you go into the eight as a number eight, infinity sign eight, moons astrology group and ask to join and you will find that tip every day in there. Yes. That wisdom I've... of the stars tip. And I've seen them and they are amazing. And the graphics as well. Uh, absolutely beautiful so do go check it out it really yeah it's it's really really it's really really beautiful thank you um so thank you so much um deborah now i hope everyone who's watching this you've enjoyed it and found it insightful because i know i have and i think i'm definitely going to have to deborah back on the show again because she has got so much information and i want to hear more about this traveling about her tra her travels you know she went out traveling for four years you know it's absolutely amazing so if people want to connect with you deborah how do they do that obviously you've mentioned um about the uh the groups is yes. there anyone anywhere else that people can connect with you um, i'm in facebook deborah moore maw and my email address deborah moore maw at hotmail.co.uk beautiful and i will put those links um in the in the comments so all people need to do is just literally click on them and they'll go i also there. have a, i also have um a website which is actually some of your readers might really like my website I, it needs upgrading but it's very fairy because i really i'm a fairy at heart um i'd never have guessed i'd never guess you were elemental in any way shape or form oh i know <laughs> <laughs> um so i've got a website if you go to deborahmore.com 
perfect. I will put that link in there as well. Um, so again, thank you so much, Deborah, for sharing your wisdom. It has been absolutely brilliant. I could listen to you forever. Um, I just, I, you're just so fascinating. You just draw us in. It's absolutely brilliant. So thank I you. I love doing so speaking. If anybody wants a speaker, I'm willing to travel. Uh, come and speak. Excellent. And I've, I've got a few people that you know, um, I might put your name forward to go on their on their podcast. Thank you. Oh, thank you. And, thank and that. So, everyone, if you are now ready to remember your divine presence and step onto your spiritual multi multidimensional path, but you feel lost, confused, stuck or alone, then please feel free to connect with me and we can see where you are now and how you can move forward to take charge of your destiny so you can spread your wings and soar. And of course, you can get a free future life progression recording that takes you into a future lifetime to gain insights you need to know and some other free gifts by signing up to my weekly newsletter. You don't get spammed. So again, thank you everyone so much for watching. I'd like to invite you to share this video as I'm sure there are more people who feel lost and want to clear on their destiny just like you and would love to hear um, Deborah's wisdom. And of course, if you're watching this on YouTube, then please do feel free to subscribe to my channel and definitely hit the bell button to be notified of when the show goes live or I post new guide meditations um, or even comment because every comment and subscription really, really does help um, promote me, my guests, get my message out there, get my guest messages out there. And I look forward to you all joining me same time, same place next week. Take care, everyone. And again, thank you so much, Deborah. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Ray.